I was with her and she was selling her wares as we were advising her to do at the farmer's market and it was going very well. But at some point in the afternoon, a car backfired <coughs> behind her and uh, the sound of it caused her to immediately dive under the table and she left not just her wares but also her cash register unattended for an extreme amount of time. And if you know that the organization I was working with is working with the IRC and the refugee community to do entrepreneurship, it makes sense that everything that she endured in Syria as a refugee, as uh, all of the things that she witnessed before she made it to Salt Lake, made it so that her mind, she had an immediate response from her body before her prefrontal cortex, before the, the rest of her could catch up and remind her that she was now safely in Salt Lake. So that instinct to die, that, that immediate reaction, is uh, of course a trauma response, and that uh, we feel like we have a perhaps slight ability to understand why that would happen. But I want to immediately also introduce you to Ben. Ben, ben might look, uh, for some of us, like someone in our organizations. He looks like someone that could be in one of my classes, and he could even be here in this room. Ben, as a composite, represents someone who is also, though, affected by trauma. He just won't see him in a refugee program. He uh, has an inability to concentrate at different times. He is surprised by the flashes of anger, and, and he doesn't respond how he means to, how he intended to, and for other, other exhibitions of trauma that we can talk about later. But uh, as I introduce you to these two different people, two different kinds of people, I want to start our day by suggesting something that I will tie to your ability to be a fantastic and incredible leader, called and human. And that is first though, to start with this idea, to plant in your head this concept that in some ways everyone is affected by trauma. And the first definition, the only one you actually see right now, is the one that most of us think of, and you assign to uh, people and extreme situations like the one I described uh, from, for Najati. And so this is the uh, definition directly from something called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, that is the most updated DSM-5 that often doctors, insurance companies use to make a diagnosis about this. And it's just like you probably already read, some exposure, whether it's yourself, whether you witness it, extreme violence, threats of death, and serious injury, or perhaps a first responder or a healthcare professional that hears about this constantly. I want to send this definition away uh, because I want to talk to you about something that doctors and therapists and professors and scholars uh, are starting to understand and soak in. And so you are hearing some of the latest research and ideas and information that you can hopefully metabolize for your uh, leadership tenure. Look at these other definitions of trauma. An experience where you became powerless, you were stripped for that time, for that period, for that situation of any self-determination. You were overwhelmed with your ability to cope. Essentially, you could not psychologically or physically or both integrate the experience. Or it was honestly any time that somehow your body learned that it couldn't protect itself. That somehow for that time and situation, fight, flight, freeze, or even fawn, as immediate physiological reactions to the situation, uh, you couldn't get your survival needs met. So when you hear definitions like this, again, adopted by doctors, uh, therapists, and hopefully each of us, then we start to understand that things like natural disasters, um, uh, diagnoses, divorce, situations that unexpected, uh, long-term ex exposure to deep poverty, to food insecurity, that sometimes, especially depending on how young somebody was, that they could be in so many positive and loving environments, but a wildfire comes through town and suddenly their ability to cope, they see their parents' ability to cope, is lost for a period of time. That is imprinted in the body and that is a trauma. And so, now that you've met Najani and Ben, and you've spent a little time with me, I want to explain briefly why I think this relates to next generation leadership and what we're going to do with the rest of our time to help you be ready. So if you accept that in this room and around us, and perhaps even in ourselves, 
there is this idea that almost everyone is affected by trauma. And what I propose is that something called trauma-informed leadership could be a very powerful, I hope it's not a secret, I want to say a secret to next generation leadership, but I hope that what we work together and collectively with a growing and large number of people behind us is change a little bit how we lead so that people can have more days uh, not activated, more days calm, more days creative and innovative instead of even temporarily living in hyperarousal fear and just survival. So what we're going to talk about is called trauma-informed leadership and there are five principles and we'll get to them before my time is up. But I want, I think we need to step back of why it might be a secret of uh, next generation leadership, but open, hopefully, uh, not very secret, secret. And I think what we're learning, again, as doctors, as scholars, as managers, I think that we're learning that we were trained. There was a gap in our training. We were trained, not wrong, but there was a gap. There's something missing in how historically we have trained leaders. And see if this makes sense, uh, this idea that I'm about to share. And that is we're starting to realize that we were trained with a gap, and so we're training people and treating people with a slight gap. And the gap is we spent too many years honoring and over-deifying uh, the idea of man as machine, company as machine. And so think about it, we talk about giving people input. We set up systems that really reward constant consistency and above all, efficiency and conformity. We, we push for that out of ourselves and out of our organizations. And what happens, that we're starting to see in the last few years, we're starting to realize that man is not a machine. Man and the burnout, the anxiety, the stress, and the belief, the understanding over more now than ever we are not machines, we're meant to treat ourselves like that or treat each other like that. So leadership used to be uh, honored for its ability to be repeat, repeatable and have tons of efficiency. And my argument is that next generation leadership will be honored when you understand your own humanity and you have a way to access, encourage, and bring out the humanity of others. So that can be done with something called trauma-informed leadership. And it's different, it's an extension and it has it has uh, neurobiology, it has a lot of roots to, uh, to great leadership principles you may have heard before. So you'll hear some things, but, you want to, but today you'll understand them, not just as good principles for people who put customers first or employees first. There's a way that you can just put humanity first and be a different kind of leader. So as I go into this, this is an important point, a place to pause. You might be like me, it took me years to accept and ponder this and include it in my life because I actually did not want to dishonor or disrespect the people that I know are all around us who are more like Najati, right? It felt like I was somehow, uh, if I talked about other people's trauma, that that was somehow disrespecting or dishonoring refugees, veterans, uh, survivors, and, um, victim survivors of so many things, of the extreme things. But I want you to know, so that you don't lose time like I did, that in terms of your leadership, all trauma is equal. Not only do you not need to hear the stories, you just can lead with, if you'll trust me, the belief that we understood that you don't need to know, but we can treat all trauma as equal as we Let's strive to be better leaders. Now, if you're a doctor, you can talk about allostatic load. I don't mean, to, again, to diminish, but I want to give you the freedom, if you're willing to believe this bullet point, then you will be faster at trying to enact some of these things. Okay. This was important, bizarrely important to my husband during our practice in the living room where we practiced this talk. Uh, he was very adamant, I think because he just came from a lot of leadership conferences as a um, man who works for Adobe, just came back from one, and he said, I think you need to let them know that these are skills. This is not another leadership style. So keep your individuality that you just heard about. Keep your uh, passion and the grit and the style that you've already developed to be the kind of man or woman that's here today. To be the kind of manager and leader that you already are. And you're here because of some of your natural uh, uniqueness. So I am not trying to change your style. I'm hoping to supercharge, encourage, or give you some skill set to make you more confident in your style. So, 
that makes me feel like I can stay in a super happy marriage where I made a goal of mine. And let's move on to what are the five features of a trauma-informed leader. And when you see these, I'm going to give you uh, some examples of things you can do today as well as tomorrow and if you have a whole year to get ready. If you could change your organization over a year. I hope you'll cherry pick what is easiest for you, what I hope you'll be proud of yourself as you recognize I'm already doing some of these things, I just didn't know how much they might be helping someone. And so, also, I'm going to spend more time on the first three and almost no time on the last two because they build. They build, and if I were to create the slide again, I'd make it like a pyramid instead of sort of equally sized boxes. So, let's jump right in, Let, again, helping you realize that you should cherry pick. We'll define them, we'll talk about why they're important, and then we'll give you actual tips to enact these, if you're so inclined. So safety, of course, exactly what it sounds like. That the people around you need to know that when they work with you, when they work perhaps for you, when you have some temporary given or assigned uh, power over someone, that they're safe in the place where you are doing the work. So it's. We're going to spend some time on the physical safety that people need to feel insured about. And then, of course, there's psychological safety. So safety being a freedom uh, and a feeling that they're free from threat or harm. So why does it matter? And I think these will make complete sense. We won't feel like that. But of course, you know for yourself that if you don't feel safe, if you are what we call sort of hypervigilant, then you can't learn and you can't work. And this is what we're hoping. These people will help us and we will get great work done. So then it's a human right, that everyone has a right to feel safe. And here is something, I hear this when I think about my son, when I hear that, and you've all heard this too, that sometimes for some people in grade school, or you know, formal school, not college, that sometimes a hot lunch at school is the only meal that person gets in a day. What I would argue for you to think about is what's already up here. Sometimes for some people, depending on their home situation, depending on, on where they're coming from before they're with you at work, in your leadership, in your care, time with you might be the only time that they're down regulated, that they do feel that safety, that they do feel, begin to open up their minds and their hearts to their full selves, not just their survival selves. So I love that you could take that charge, like you might be the only time, or time around you might be the only time that someone is, is safe. So this is what some safe leaders do. Some of this will be very natural to you, but yet we still need to remind people. That authentic warmth that you've been encouraged to develop and own, that actually is, research shows that that is valuable. Micro, uh, steady and consistent micro uh, interactions begin to build evidence for people. So your authentic warmth matters. Checking in, you'd be surprised. Is today an okay day for us to continue with this plan? Uh, is it better for me to come back later in the day. How are you? How are you really? Some companies who really embody this even have kind of a red, yellow, green slider that you can put underneath your name. Like if it's my name tag on my door, or are having a particularly difficult day, I can move that slider to red and people can say, I'll come back when it's green if it's not urgent. Or it allows people to not have to ask you to re-trigger you, but to know what they're working with. So something as simple as we could all go around with a red, yellow, green badge and understand that that's a form of check-in or making check-in easier. Uh, for people who are temporarily, occasionally, this isn't constant. That's why people can't even tell you or warn you that it might happen. But for people who are having a manifestation of trauma at work, they're either in hyperarousal, constriction, or intrusion. And so you communicating clearly can help them know what's next, and that's a form of safety. And then lastly, you know, I've been watching a lot of commercials showing surprise parties. Surprise, I don't know why it's in popular culture, sort of pre portrayed as always good, and, um, or good, and if it's bad, it's humorous. But what I want to talk about is no surprises in this context is actually a safety element. When people uh, are surprised, they, and it does trigger something, then they go back to that hypervigilance and they go out of creativity. So, safety, it makes a lot of sense to a lot of the time, but being around you, the way you talk, the way that is a form of safety. So today you can actually smile and adopt a calmer tone. A lot of times you got put into a leadership position 
and you feel a sense of urgency to get things done, or because you feel the need to change so much in the world and you have a sense of urgency, or you don't, you're still stressed yourself, you have only a little bit of time to pass on your thoughts and needs and directions as a leader. And so something called slow, low, low can also help. I really try to do this myself, and I'm still learning. And that's where you actually slow your pace, you lower your volume, and you lower the cadence, the pitch. And I used to come in so excited about all my energy, but that hyperactivity almost could really be activating. And so I can alter it. It's still to be myself. I'm a free energetic person. But I've also learned that when it's a really important instruction, I can go practice slow, low, low. So what can I do tomorrow? Getting more curious. Stop assuming that everyone's life uh, might be uh, different, might have no trauma in it. It's just beginning to think <laughs> like that will change how you treat people. So you see here, we have replaced what we used to teach people sort of a stare and scare. Shut the door, talk to them directly, maybe use your finger, and talk about the issues. And now we are saying, why don't we do a walk and talk that allows people not only to have a sense of space, but also to release some of that energy that's stored up from there in that intense survival mode. And lastly, the physical environment is something that is very worth thinking about. We're trying to do more with less, but people who are prone to have a trauma response, particularly when you're giving them feedback or growth opportunities, if you shut a door, if people are triggered, they're watching for exits, windows, are you blocking the exit? Could you make it just simple to change where you give feedback so that someone can feel the space? And they just down-regulate. The space is safe. They can hear your input. They can learn. They can go on and act accordingly. No one's ever triggered. So in a way, I'm giving you the secrets to manage the amygdalas of all the people that you work with. You're just helping people stay calm, receptive, and what happens when you're calm and receptive? You are not only able to access all the inspiration you've already known, you're able to access your creativity, your ingenuity, and that's what you want people that you need to do. So I told you I'll spend more time on the beginning because safety is that, is that beginning groundwork, that framework. But now you need people to have a voice in decision making and that they don't feel trapped in your rhetorical questions or trapped in not enough time to think or answer. So giving choice is partly what that means. So why does it matter? Because of course, as soon as you feel that there are no choices, then you feel fear. And you want independence and resilience. So what does it mean? You probably could guess, stepping back, uh, trying yourself to be more open-minded. But let's talk about scaffolding. Did you know that people in extreme poverty actually have it? There's less development in the forward future thinking portion, the potential, the power that's underdeveloped in their brains. So suddenly coming into town and saying, what would you do with a million dollars? What are your dreams for the future for you and your children? This is actually a counterproductive behavior, even though we think we're helping people to open up and innovate for the future. But if someone has spent a whole entire life or a portion or an event where they have not been able to learn. No one's asked them and helped them or taught them how to make good choices. They don't, that's what we mean by scaffolding. Can you model how you make some decisions? Can you, if you do realize you might be in a position that this is needed, can you, that's what scaffolding means. Can you minimize the choices so there's only maybe three and help people see how each one might turn out? You again are helping people learn that you actually need it when you give them a choice. So, Helping people embrace choice. So bounce back, I think, is fancy for the Socratic method. If someone asks you a question, sometimes you're so proud that you finally made it to a leadership position that you'll answer them quickly. I have the answer. Leaders have all the answers. But this is a change where instead you'll be a leader that asks, what do you do? What do you think we should do? Or what would happen if? Uh, why don't we think about it? Let's ask about some other people. You really are asking questions instead of quickly showing off your leadership knowledge. Offering many choices. Should we sit here or should we talk about this out here? Many choices make people believe that you have this, short, this, this foundation for them. So letting go of control is the final, most extensive thing to do. So we only have, we have three left, and I'll move pretty quickly. Of course, if people feel safe, and they believe that you trust them to make choices, and you've, you've modeled for them how you make choices, then it's time to do some things together. So the ability to collaborate and foster that in a trauma-informed mindset is what we need to do next. Of course, why do we need this? Stronger systems are built with everybody. And we're learning that. We're really embracing that for different reasons. 
you're already learning this in your classes, but no one told you that doing this will also make you a trauma informed leader. So, including others is a pretty big deal. You can imagine, just like some of the leaders and the paintings and the sculptures we just saw, sometimes that stepping back is the ultimate mark of a confident, capable, down-regulating, amygdala-managing leader. Uh, that reaching out and that breaking down barriers. I think we saw more with the last presentation about how to collaborate, how to foster that in yourself, than we need to talk about in detail. Have you ever thought of the idea of asking for the opinion of the potentially least experienced person first? A lot of times we take the ideas of the most vocal or the most experienced and then when there's a moment of silence, when the best ideas have been sucked out of the room, or the room is already going in a direction, that's often when leaders ask for someone who hasn't spoken yet, or ask for, we haven't heard from you, so-and-so. And that's the worst time, as I just described. The best ideas have already, perhaps, been put out there, and the room already has an energy either towards completion or towards one of the ideas that's already been given. So you can help people contribute and collaborate with you if you actually switch up how you get people to contribute and collaborate. So these are very tactical things you might already be prone to do or have been contemplating and wonder if it's worth it or will it make you look too humble. So I hope you feel some validation, some, but not just human or professorial validation, but this is medically validated, that some of these decisions will keep the people around you in a creative place, in a open place. So commit to doing things with people, not to them, not even for them, in a distance-making, magnanimous, magical, I'll do this for you. Let's do this together. Conversations about co-creation that are genuine will also be a measure of your prominent form of leadership. And as you know, over time, rotating roles, giving away your leadership when you're ready, when you're at that point in your own life, will be helpful. So the last two for you are trust and empower. And you can imagine that people only trust you when they've been safe over and over again. When you've been reliable, consistent, where you've managed your own, uh, your own panic attacks, your own bad days. When you've managed them so well that you don't trigger other people so consistently, then they're going to work for you and with you. And they're going to, more importantly than any of that, they're going to find their own humanity and have another day, another successful day without being triggered. So everyone needs to know what to expect from each other if we're going to do the work we all want to do. We all, these people, all of us, our trauma responses have actually separated us, not just sometimes from believing in the pure love that we can get from Heavenly Father and from our testimonies, from ourselves and from you know, the belief that maybe there are other people who really can love us consistently. So even though he says sometimes you might be the only place someone is safe, sometimes people get attached to work, coworkers, an appropriate attachment because they are so grateful that another day, another person, another place is a safe place where they can have echoes of what it is like to have safe, appropriate attachment to ideals, to people, and to organizations. If you can foster that, that's pretty amazing in our leadership. So we need trust so that you can leave the room and go on to other great work and that you can leave people behind in their own leadership. So this is what it looks like and you wouldn't, won't be surprised. It all stems from the other, the other three ideas. If you've been doing them, you've been consistent. You haven't given up when someone isn't a machine and doesn't rely back the same way every time. Um, you're predictable. Perhaps that's the most machine-like analogy we'll keep around. Uh, and you place trust in others openly. You say things like, because I trust you, I'm going to leave a little bit early. I know you can manage this event. Or because I trust you, I am going to put you as the headliner. Because I trust you, it's OK to say over and over again. So earn it. There's a whole other presentations on how to earn trust. Be honest. Sounds like you already heard about that, and including one something for being honest in everything from rock, paper, scissors to how you report your taxes and any other important things I can do. Um, but over time, uh, really, it's so tempting to tell the things we learn, but helping people know that you're a safe spot to the confidentiality. And so lastly, you're expecting this. The exact opposite when someone's finally safe and when you're not building scaffolding is when your job as a leader is, in some ways, you've done such a great job when people can be themselves and do more and are empowered to use their strengths and skills, to believe they have them and to use them. 
in that unit the way they are now. So it comes to create gives people confidence, and the only way to do it is for you to invest and for you to leave no one behind and for you to advance good ideas. So you know how to do this. You listen. You actually invite challenges to your point of view. But much harder because sometimes we work so hard to be a leader that we think our point of view is the main one. Now, we take challenges as a threat. You don't think I should be a leader because you're challenging me. But if you can overcome this, you can help other people overcome things. Over time, you need to audit and really put in processes that empower people. There's so much more, but there's also this is enough to begin. And so I want to say, again, our old models, the ones that some of your leaders were trained in, were to insist on that constant uh, conformity and uh, consistency, and of course, ultimately, efficiency. We have built whole organizations that reward that the most. But I think the next generation leaders, you, who are so open-hearted, if you're here, you're even extra working to be open-hearted, I want you to know that that's validated at a research level, as well as a human instinctual level, that that will actually bring out more kindness, support, creativity, and health and the people that you work with and in yourself. So trauma-informed leadership could be your superpower. Uh, as you react not just to what comes at you in our turbulent world, but the things you can't see. As a leader, you're always trying to deal with what, what is coming, but also what you can't even see, and histories you don't know. And this quote is maybe one of the most important ways, part of you, some of you, so, especially some of us, trained so long in the machine model. I'd say, are we just catering? We're not catering to anyone's weakness. We are building a culture and uh, uh, becoming a place where other people's strengths can shine. And with that note, I hope that you'll ponder some of these, consider if you can weave them, how you can weave them today, tomorrow, and with more information next year. But that is what I wish for you, and I'm grateful for your attention, and I'm grateful that now the secret is out to you know, like 100 more people. And this is increasingly being talked about, as I said, by your doctors, by therapists, by any of us who are in education, that we want to see you better, and we want to train people to, so we all see each other better in the world. So thank you for your efforts. Thanks, guys. OK, Lisa. Uh, picking from one of many great questions, uh, how can we relate and help those who have gone through traumatic events when we have not gone through a similar traumatic event? You guys really did, because they're the tough ones. What an important question, but also that's a tough one. In some ways, though, I guess I started to answer it. It means a lot when people, people can't control these reactions, right? You've heard of the, the book, The Body Keeps the Score, or there's a much more accessible book by uh, Gabor Mate about the myth of normal that helps us understand that it's all around. So partly you could read these books. My preference would be to suggest The Myth of Normal. So accessible to read. Brand new book, Gabor Mate is the author. It will help you. He kind of turns it on his head and makes us believe and understand uh, how we can have more compassion and understanding of the trauma that is around us. So first, the answer part is reading. Uh, I think that will calm you down to feel more prepared. It's a big book, too. It's easy, uh, but long. And I think the other is to keep, it's, you're going to see this more and more. And in some ways, you are some of the first people to hear how common this is hopefully going to become in more events like this, in classrooms. We're starting to see people try to adopt these really at a grade school level. People are starting to understand that there were major interruptions to how, in all of, all of or a lot of English, you'll see this around you and you'll be able to support it. So you can also, that's part of the answer. But the real question was, what do we do if we have no history of a trauma to draw from for our empathy or something? Right. Yeah, yeah. How can we relate to somebody and yeah. and do so fairly? I, I think if we come in. I mean, you hear a lot about this mistake yeah. where somebody has suffered an incredible loss, and you go in and try to fix it. Right. You can't understand it. It's hard <laughs> to fix. You just say, "I'm so sorry for your loss." 
So a similar question here with traumatic leaders, how can a leader who recognizes trauma in somebody that they're leading right. be able to connect with that person without being would, offensive? Yes, thank you. I would argue then that you don't, that isn't what is required to help. So take that pressure off of yourself. You are living with a version of what I did. But once I do know people and have worked with people and have been quite close to people who we call maybe capital T trauma, I told you I didn't want to disrespect them by um, by trying to see or support, what is it, lowercase t trauma? So I hope that you are, you relieve yourself of that. What is needed is leaders who are trying, who are down-regulated themselves. So managing your own mental health is a huge gift. Your hyperness and hyper you know, dysregulation will be transferred to partners, children, and colleagues. So managing yourself, um, but <coughs> Take that pressure off yourself. <clears throat> Trying to do some of our tactics, even without your own history, <laughs> will still create workplaces where people, they don't know why they feel calm around you. They don't know why they can only create when they're in the team with you or on your team, but they are able to access that creativity if they spend one extra day not triggered. And so you don't have to have it happen to you for you to be amazing for the people around you. So take that pressure off yourself. Thank you. That's wonderful. Another question that I got, like 72. Comment here. How can I possibly boil this down to one question? I want to take a class from her and learn more because I have way too many questions. <laughs> so can I sign up for a class? Yes, I want to talk about this. Uh, so a couple things I wanted to say to you. Go for it. Like I locked the idea. Uh, just like Ava, today's the first time I've even openly talked about this or given this presentation. And it's because of you. You made me brave thinking people are coming on Saturday morning, signing up, willing to tear any leader's profit. What could I really give you that's not just like a day in one of my classes? When I first signed up, like, it'll be easy, I'll just do a day in one of my classes. And I made it hard. I made it hard on me, and I tried to be brave for you. So you made me brave. You brought this already to the fore with your energy, your willingness to come to this. So that's a thank you, and it sounds like if people value it, it's your energy that makes can I also take the other question? Sure. Take, take down these questions. You've got the microphone. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to share two things. I actually teach, it might be unpopular at a leadership summit, but I actually teach that it's uh, that we need followers, that we followership is an understudied, underappreciated, undervalued, undertaught, but vitally necessary to have faithful, thoughtful, careful, followers choosing with Heavenly Father how and who and what to follow, please do not, again, I think the word is cheap and how important that is. And if you say, I am a great follower, that is my superpower, to be energized, to catch a vision, to help people, to make them feel understood, please value yourself. And that is a form of self-leadership. It is a form of existing in this world, honoring it's just amazing it's needed. So it's actually we over, we over, and, and, and generally also talked about it's not a formal position. You are a leader to someone around you by merely following with faith and conviction. So merely, by importantly, following with faith and conviction. And so I just wanted to say that. And then, yes, I, I'm going to take people and study abroad to Italy. So if you really want to talk about travel all day and all night in Milan, let's do that. That sounds good. <laughs> Sign me up. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Question for you. Before we get to Ava again, and that is, do you believe that those who have suffered acute trauma can ever overcome its negative effects? Okay, I'm a doctor, but not that one. But um, I'm in, still studying this. But my answer is is actually yes. I go to conferences about this, week-long conferences at, at Harvard, at the top institutions with, with all the clinicians who are working with the most extreme forms of, of, of cruelty that are in our world. And there is hope in all these conferences. That is people who aren't even, don't have access to the power of the saber. These are people working with all the worldly tools the best institutions. And we are learning the steps you can take, the order that we can do therapeutic interventions, the power of the people around us. That's what I try to teach you about. Um, we're learning so much so fast. I think we're guided. I think they're guided. 
but with the pace of the unkindness, there is also a rapid pace of the beauty and the healing and the energy to do this. And so I believe, and some of those tactics we did talk about, people owning their story, not by telling it and oversharing, but by, um, but by healing slowly. So it's slow, and you can be part of it, and you won't be anything worse. Thank you.